everybody, and welcome back to Rugby Wrap-Up and this week's Martial Law with Colby Marshall. Colby, welcome. What do you got for us? What's up, Matt? This is what I got for you. The turning point in each match from week three, starting off with Rugby ATL versus San Diego. In the first half, Rugby ATL dominated territory, but only had a three-point lead to show for it. What broke this game open was what happened only a few minutes into the second half when San Diego's errant pass led to an interception try by ATL substitute Martini Talapusi. What ultimately hurt the Legion at this point in the game was I think their offense became a little too predictable and that allowed Rugby ATL to really come up hard and come up fast and force that turnover that broke the game open for Rugby ATL. Very, very good, solid win for Scott Lawrence and co. I didn't see it. What, what's next? Next, the Texas Cup, Austin versus Houston. This is a game that a lot of people were looking forward to, a game that Austin needed to win. You know, they're own, they were 0-2 going into the match. You don't want to go 0-3 and lose the Texas Cup in the same week. So it was big that they came away with the victory in what was a lopsided affair. So it's really hard to pinpoint a turning point, but the difference in the game was definitely the penalties that Houston piled up early on in the first half. Austin's first three tries came off the back end of a Houston penalty, one of which was a deliberate trip made by Diego Magno that gave the Gogronis that man advantage that they capitalized on. You know, it was 19 to nothing by the time Magno came back on the field, so the game was pretty much over. Yeah, Magno, it was really not a smart play. Will McGee was on kick chase. He kind of pushed him or tried to trip him right in front of the referee and the assistant referee. Not where you want to do that, but it wasn't an imperative play that Will McGee was bound to make. I'm not taking away from you, Will. So just save your letters. But three tries out of the front row, two going to the hooker cook. Very impressive out of the gate. And they made them pay on those sin bin penalties. Yeah, those Austin forwards, they really came to play. What do you got next? So next up, Toronto versus Old Glory. I mean, this is a game that you called. Toronto took an early 15 to nothing lead that Old Glory cut in half right before the break. But I think when Danny Tusitala, you know, was in possession of the ball and he made an errant pass that gave the ball back to Toronto before the end of the first half, you know, that proved to be the turning point because Toronto came right back and scored a dropping goal that put them up 18 to 7 as opposed to 15 to 7. Uh, and so Toronto used that momentum going into the second half and scored a try by way of Ben Lesage to make it 25 to 7. So if you're old glory, uh, I don't know if they're going to think about this as a team, but I think they're definitely going to have more momentum going into the half down 15 to 7 after scoring that try to cut the lead in half as opposed to being down 18 to 7 and giving a little bit of that momentum back to the Arrows. Yeah, speaking of the Arrows, I have to apologize to Mr. Dutois and Mr. Browdy for mispronouncing their names, guys. I am very, very sorry. Next up. Yeah, next up, Utah versus New England. I mean, this is a game that might have been for a rugby purist as there wasn't a point scored until a quarter of the way into the match. I want to say when it was 11-7 to in the second half, when New England was able to score a try off of a mall after a nice little clever delivery from Harrison Boyle to Dougie Fife to make it 16-8. to And that kind of broke the game open at that point in the match, in a, in a match that was pretty tight-knit up until that point. But I think the difference was the goal kicking from Bowden Walker, the fullback for New England. He had four conversions, a few of which came from pretty tough distances. So you got to figure if he misses one of those kicks, they don't come away with a win in the match. Yeah, and he's also a New Zealand seven-star. And if he was a baseball player like a Boston Red Sox, he would be a five-tool player. What else you got? Is that it? That wraps up the games, Matt. But I want to say good job calling that uh, calling that Toronto Arrows match. I, I enjoyed your I enjoyed your call. Thank you, sir. It's a work in progress. We're getting better every time. And uh, I got to thank that crew. They were they were exceptional down there. What are you looking forward to most this this coming weekend? I'm looking forward to seeing how LA is going to respond to Utah being at top of the table now. You know, they're coming off of a bye week. Are they going to get too complacent with how they've been playing? Are they going to continue to play at this level? Are they going to take it up a notch? Uh, it's going to be exciting to see how the Guiltinis are going to come out um, after their bye week in second place right behind Utah. Yeah, and you know, the Warriors may have lost in New England, but they did make it close. The, the, the last try was after extra time, but they did not quit. And that is no longer, again, I'm going to say it again, is no longer a 60-minute team. MLR, beware. Yeah, Utah is notorious for struggling in the last 20 minutes of matches in the past, but not, not so much this season. An astute observation by my esteemed colleague, Colby Marshall. And that wraps up this week's Martial Law. 
Thank you, Colby. And please check out our other segments, including our Major League Rugby show, our Global Rugby Recap, What Are the Odds, our Major League Rugby Sports Bet show with the Philly Godfather, John Bradshaw Layfield, the WWE legend, and Gifty Bailu, Martial Law, The Zack Attack. And please sign up for our American Red Cross Rugby Wrap-Up Blood Donor Team.